Welcome to Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and once again, I'm delighted to be joined by Stevie Mullen. Stevie, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, Paul. Thanks for inviting me through. It's great to see you. There's been a lot happened over the week since you've last been in the studio, Stevie. And at the risk of repeating ourselves and going over old ground, I think it is relevant. You know, when you look at the two games that you've missed since you've been in the studio, um, two sides of Celtic, or do you think actually we've seen some of the issues in both games it just so happens we are against lesser opposition on Sunday normally you would say it's been a tumultuous week for Celtic but now it just seems to be normal mm. when I left here last Thursday afternoon after being sacked for the, the match <laughs> due to asking for a bit of pizza we the pizza were, was good we were really looking forward to Celtic playing against Slavia Prague thinking mm. we get three points when three points away, we would be in second or third place getting into the next group games. And then we had a disastrous, disastrous performance last Thursday night against Slavia Prague, where I thought only two people got past marks, which would have been Jeremy Frimpong and Laxalt. I thought the Malays started very early on through Mir Beton and Scott Bain, and then it just manifested itself through the team. And I know guys really, really like these two players, for me last week, I seen Elianusi and Tom Rogic duking out of challenges. And for me, that's unacceptable. Totally unacceptable. You've got a Celtic jersey on that you're not going to get in for a tackle. Now, don't expect them to be crunching tackles, but you've got to put your foot in to try and win the ball. Well, remember back in the day, the player that always comes to my mind about uh, shirking out of tackles was Reggie Blinker. Remember, Blinker yep. used to run up to the ball shake his dreads a wee bit and then shirk out the challenge and uh, you you know you don't cut the mustard with that that kind of stuff I noticed that about Rogic as well and actually you know we know that the, the performance he gave against Motherwell but going into that game Stevie I was looking at I thought well Rogic gave us one of his uh, his poorer performances on the Thursday night I mean what Tom Rogic turns up um, is key because if he isn't the guy that's setting up the two goals it's the other end of the scale with Tommy Rogic I feel you never get that that consistency with him. Well, he's a fantastic talent, and you would much like him, I prefer him to be in the offensive position that he takes up and creates chances. But all I'm saying is, if you're in the middle of the park, there's sometimes, just sometimes, you need to put your foot in for a challenge. And I can't abide them, no want to challenge for the ball. You know, guys would get their eye teeth to be in that position, you know, without that ability. So that was an unacceptable thing. Then you get into the post match. And wow, you know, for Neil Lennon's comments, you know, it's unacceptable, there's no hunger, there's no desire, there's got to be a culture change. And you're thinking, God almighty, you know. And then you get into the next day, things have calmed down. I watch your show every day, you know, I like listening to Jim Orr, you know, and he's saying the four centre-forwards are too similar, we should buy a big guy. I'm thinking, I don't think I've ever seen four centre-forwards who are so different. And I don't believe that Neil Lennon would just stick a big guy and hit the ball to. No. You know, so there's a real difference of opinion amongst the Celtic fans just now that's manifesting it through shows like this and through social media where we've all got a different opinion. You know, I listen to it every day and I think it's great that everybody who's on here, we're all Celtic fans, but basically we all disagree on mm -hmm. what we're seeing. Yeah, yeah. The, the big thing is, Stephen, it's good that you brought the point up is we aren't on here just to look for negatives. We're not here to look at, at the negative. Um, how, if something isn't working, we've got to discuss it and we've got to give our views on it. So when we are looking at the performance, the two performances since you were last in last Thursday, um, you know, I might get accused of being negative because, you know, I, I didn't think it was a great performance against Motherwell. Um, but, you know, when you're looking at that third goal, and I think Kevin Maguire said it yesterday, when you're looking at that third goal by El Yunusi, you know, that was so decisive because at that point you're expecting Motherwell to be able to score again because my, my big issue is the defence, the capability within the defence. You know, Jim's uh, comments in relation to the striker, Stevie, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm thinking we've got a, a real good variety of strikers up there. It doesn't look as though Neil Lennon is going to get a partnership that, that we had last season out at Edward and Griffiths. He's using the players differently. A Yeti has shown uh, an ability to do a lot of work outside the box. I think when he came in, we were told he was a kind of box goal scorer, one of these kind of poachers type players. I don't think he's that at all, although he is decisive in the box. Um, and of course, you've got Edward, and we've not yet seen 
um, the full range of, of skills and abilities of Odson Edward through a few different reasons. One that we've got to always remember being the, the fact that he, that, you know, he tested positive for COVID. So I, I don't have the concerns in the offensive side of the park. I, I'm looking at, you know, a lineup that's got like Salt on the left, Frimpong on the right, Edward in the middle, or a Yeti or Griffiths, and then behind him with, you know, Christie, Rogic, and El Yunusi. That's frightening for any team to face. But behind that, then you start to have problems. Now, one of the, the issues that um, I don't know if anyone can answer it, uh, I think the only person that can answer it is the gaffer if he makes the changes. Every single week, we've got McGregor and Brown there, and they're sitting um, almost in the same area of the pitch, one right, one left. Is that where the defensive frailties begin? Are they two? Are they playing too similarly? I don't think they're too similar in style, but are they playing too similarly? Is McGregor being uh, wasted too far back uh, in the field? Stevie, you've you've been involved in football. What's your take on that? And can we maybe mix it up in that area? If you do, are you then looking to remove one of the three attacking players in Christy, El Yunusi and Rogic? Because after Thursday night's game, I thought Rogic was the guy that would have been taken out of the team. He performed pretty well against Motherwell. So it's a game-by-game -game basis, and that's unusual for Celtic. But we, we defend from the front, or that's where you should defend. Now, if you remember the game last week against Slavia Prague, after Lee Griffiths came on, we were trying to shut them down, and a Yeti was going to the right-hand side, Griffiths. They're turning around, and people are 50 metres behind them. Mm -hmm. so, so you're no defending for the front. You've just took two guys out of play. If you're going to defend, you defend for the front and everybody's in a position. I've stated on numerous occasions on this show that Scott Brown isn't a holding midfield player. He's only your deepest lying midfielder. Scott Brown's a fantastic player, but he doesn't have that discipline to play that position. As we've seen on Sunday, when he's doing well, getting the ball, and then he's going back and trying to roll the years back a few years, but trying to swagger. But he's keeping the ball away. The ball he's putting us under pressure. Yep. You know, we go into Sunday's game in the back. I'll, I'll, we'll go back to Thursday night, sorry. Our two central defenders showed a naivety beyond belief. Beaton gets caught with a cross, and in the third goal, Shane Duffy, if he's got anything about him, must just take the guy out and take a yellow card. Instead of that, or nice, the only person I've seen in the Celtic, well, two people, one particularly, taking guys out and prepared to take a yellow card was a wee guy, Sorrow, the night when we were playing Leo, mm -hmm. and Ryan Christie does it. Everybody else lets everybody run by it. I've even seen guys saying, bring on David Turnbull to see the game out. We brought David Turnbull on it, but Audrey, and yeah. he let the guy run by him. You know, we've got to be more astute when we're playing the game. We, we praised them the night when Greg Taylor and Barkas was taking all the time away from home to see the game out. Mm -hmm. That's right. But we're being naive beyond belief. So we get the comments after the game from Neil, there's a lack of hunger, there's a lack of application, we need to have a culture change. We go to Sunday and there's two changes. And I commented into the show, I think it was a lazy selection. And mm -hmm. my reasons for saying that was the two guys who dropped out of the team was Shane Duffy, who's had a terrible start to his Celtic career. But I don't think he could probably question his hunger or his application or his will to do well for Celtic. And a young man who's gone back for a life-threatening illness so from Thursday night to Sunday at midday, nine guys get a pass. I, 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 I can't understand the comments and then basically playing the same team. It was in, in the same shape as well, Stevie. And I think when you come out, and this is the point that I've made many times on the podcast, Stevie, and you come out with comments around the culture of the club, and that's what I'm interested in uh, today is talking about where does it change? What elements of the culture is going to change it. What ones are Neil Lennon pinpointing? Because when you're looking at a culture, and I think Chris Sutton touched on this, you don't take, you certainly don't change a culture in three days, and you don't change the culture generally with the same management. And that's what surprised me with, with Neil Lennon's comments, because it was almost as if to say, well, who changes the culture, Stevie? Is it Neil Lennon that changes it? If the players um, are already agitating, as he suggested against the Ferenc Varos after their defeat there. Um, are they going to change? Are they still looking to January to, to move on? Is it at that point that the culture can change? Or is it a managerial change that's going to be required? And again, that's been all the talk. It's been all the talk for the last few weeks. Um, and it's, you know, going game to game, you get a wee glimmer of hope against Lille. Brilliant 60 minutes against Lille. 
Um, and then we come through against Aberdeen, you're thinking, well, maybe we'll get a bit of momentum here. And then, you know, the worst performance of the season against Sparta Prague, followed up by a comprehensive enough victory against Motherwell, but completely, um, I think, when you're looking at the scoreline, I think it was unfair, actually, um, you know, because it gives it a glean of dominance, whereby, as I say, at 2-1, Motherwell were going for an equaliser at that stage. So there's so many issues surrounding these comments that I have. And there's a lot of Celtic fans who think once the guys come back from injury, it's like a magic wand and everything is going to fall into place. If it's a cultural issue, a couple of players coming back in and playing in the first team isn't going to change the culture. If you go to Sunday's team, everybody's fit. I don't think there's many changes from Sunday starting 11. But we have a, a real problem that Celtic always prided herself on being the fittest team, even going back to Mr Steen. Mm-hmm. Now, I think it's an issue. If we're highlighting Lee Griffiths and Sutton made him the, the topic the other day about he's not fit and he's overweight, he's been back at Lennox Town for a minimum of four months. How does it take that long to get fit? Another wee example, if you don't mind me telling you, is the goals that we've conceded. We were always famous for scoring goals late on in games. Yeah. But this is the goals we've conceded. And just in the last wee while... Ferenc Faros, 74 minutes. Livingston, 78 minutes. Milan, the 90th minute. Lille, 65 and 75. Prague, 77 and 90. Aberdeen, 65 and 92. So you usually concede goals when the other team's fitter or you're going through a bit of fatigue. So we have a problem there and I think we have a real problem with the shape of the team. And again, when we're talking about seeing a game out, you can't change the personnel and play the same way to see a game out. So if we go back to, to Murrowell, and we were to take off Frimpong and Laxalt off, and we replaced them with El Hamid and Greg Taylor. They need to stay in a full-back position. You don't see the game out by changing the guys and allow them to continue to play the same way as your two guys have replaced. Mm-hmm. You know, you take your wide midfield player, you bring on Sorrow, you stifle up the middle of the park, you can't play like for like and expect to see you a game. You know, at the weekend, Shane Duffy quite rightly has been criticised. Beat on, seen the ball for 65 yards going into the box and you couldn't get a fag paper. So who do we blame for Sunday? Because Shane Duffy's not there. No, this is it. This is the thing. It's extended beyond blaming the goalie, blaming Shane Duffy, blaming the central defensive areas. And I think one of the big uh, queries, and, and it's been spoken about and raised by Celtic fans on the podcast over a number of weeks, if not months, Stevie, is the the plan for Scott Brown. So you're looking at Scott Brown at the moment, he's a captain, he's a leader, but there seems to be no plan because it's not as though he's getting any less game time. He's been brought off a couple of times. He didn't start one game. St. Johnson, was it? Um, so I think when you're looking at what the succession plan is, we should have been looking at that three seasons ago. We're now looking at a situation where it's not working, so it's not a great time to try and plan it. It should have already been planned. Was the plan Sorrow? Was the plan Turnbull? And and if so, why are they, are they not getting any minutes? Um, McGregor is far more effective. I've seen some comments by an XL during the week saying that McGregor shouldn't play for Scotland tonight. But McGregor certainly isn't best utilised where he's playing at this moment in time. And it seems to me as though he's doing a lot of running uh, to make up maybe for Scott Brown because of where he's sitting on the, on the field. And we know how effective Callum McGregor can be as an offensive player. It was a big criticism we had when Brendan Rodgers um, played him left back at Ibrox. You know, he's one of our most creative offensive players who can get a goal and he's done it so often for us, Stevie, and we're playing him defensively. So I, I do think the central defence and goalkeeper is an issue. If we're just looking at um, areas of the pitch beyond the culture, and I do think that the McGregor-Brown partnership at the moment is an issue. What would you do to change that? All being well, everyone being fit, probably barring um, James Forrest, who's out for a couple of months at the moment. So Julien's back, let's say Frimpong's back, Ayer's back, and we're facing Hibs. Um, Barkas and Bain, there's also that, that question. So how, how would you shape your team up against Hibs? I think in the middle of the park, we've got to admit Scott Brown has been a fantastic servant and he's still a great player. But do we need two defensive midfield players if we're going to be playing domestically? I don't think we do. If we can work as a team, the now we seem to be working as a group of individuals, 
going forward we look great defensively we look te terrible I think that that's something you can work on and really eliminate a lot of the, the defensive mistakes mm -hmm. again if you're asking me do I think what Neil Lennon would do I think Neil Lennon will play Scott Brown and Callum McGregor in the same positions we go to play Hibernian if it was me I wouldn't play them I thought I would start with Zorro and it's, it's not because I think he's the greatest thing in the world but I think he's got an energy and enthusiasm about him and that wee bit of experience about him that he'll just take the foul mm -hmm. you know when you stated that we're letting guys run through it numerous of times in Sat Sunday in the second half just running through our midfielders nobody's making a challenge nobody's making a tackle and the next thing they run your box with a chance if they had a predator on Sunday we could have had a much difficult game no, I absolutely agree with that. Um, and it's a point I did make, Stevie, because you look at the Motherwell teams of old, I mean, we could go even further back because Celtic were good at signing Motherwell strikers, you know, right back to Dixie Deans. For example, Joe McBride had, had been prolific. Uh, right up to your Scott McDonald, let's not talk about him uh, playing for Motherwell. You know, they, they have always had that Stevie Kirk type player, well, Dougie Arnett. Yeah, I mean, if they had one of their boys against us on Sunday, we were in trouble. Now, the big thing that, that happens, and this is typical of football fans, I'm not criticising uh, the, the attitude here, but the Duffy scenario, the Duffy dilemma, all of a sudden, I and Julien's a good partnership. All of a sudden, we're praying for, for Julien to come back in. Now, you think back to the game against Ross County, I remember Kevin Graham being very critical of the defence in the first half. They cut us open three or four times. And then you look at the game against Kilmarnock. We were so unhappy with that performance, Ayer got benched for the next game. So what we've got here, we've got a four and a half million pound goalie coming in, seven million pound uh, defender in, in Julien. We've got a Republic Island international in Duffy, who was the answer, according to most people, me included. Um, and you've got Ayer, who's wanted by AC Milan. Yet, a simple set piece cuts right through that at the moment. How do we resolve that? Well, if you go back to last week, again, we're going to play Slavia Prague. I, I was astonished that Nier Beton was playing on the left-hand side. I've never seen Nier Beton play on the left-hand side of anywhere. There he is. He's in there as your other centre-half. When we go to the weekend, if you're going to be struggling, it's dead easy. You get somebody to stand in front of the guy Gallica and Beton goes behind him. We don't have that. We're just marking space. The ball's going over your head. That should be an easy, easy ball for a central defender if it's travelled that distance and it's floating there. We lost the header, and again, I, I think the goalkeeper was pretty poor in his reaction to it. So you need to set up, and you need to be working on that constantly training where the guys don't get a free header. Mm -hmm. I, I listened to the show the night the guy for Edinburgh City was in here, and the panel made up, said, and it was universally accepted, that Julian can't play against a big centre forward. Nuri absence is making the heart grow fonder and we can't wait to get him back after the international break without even playing a game. Mm -hmm. So, what's made them that good when he's been out that they want to go back? Personally thinking, I would have never had him out of the team if he wasn't injured. I think he's a great player. But because he's no playing, he's becoming good. The amount of people are here saying, can't wait to get James Forrest back. Mm -hmm. James Forrest was slaughtered by the Celtic fans. Derided, yeah. So, they're not there, they're becoming better. If Julian is fit, and gets to be match fit, I would still play him, Christopher Ayer, and Shane Duffy as my three at the back. And then you're continuing with Laxalt and Frimpong, left and right? I would to El Hamid. Mm. Right, you know. Gives you a wee bit more stability defensively. Because I heard the wee conversation you and Kevin had the other day, and it was really quite good. But he, he, here's a wee thing, you know, and when you these guys were talking, you were saying about he's too small to be a fullback in a modern game. So here's a wee thing, right? Jeremy Frimpong's 1.75 metres tall. Ben Chilwell, who went for 50 million, 1.78. Kieran Trippier, who's playing for Atletico Madrid, 1.73. Kieran Tini, 25 million pound, 1.78. Trent Alexander and Andy Robertson, who's probably the best defensive partnership, probably European football. Arnold's 1.75, Robertson's 1.78. Danny Rose, who's played for Tottenham, Newcastle, 1.73. Seamus Coleman, the ex-captain of Republic, 1.77. And Jordi Alba, who, Barcelona, won everything in the game, 1.7 metres. So his height isn't the problem. 
Absolutely not. You know, it's his ability and his shape in the game. Mm. He's got lots of attributes. Defending is not one of them. So the height isn't the problem. It's where you fit him in. Mm -hmm. You know, Slavia Prague, I thought it was an absolute shame the young guy was trying, but he seemed to be the only offensive option we had in that game. And to be fair to the wee man, when he takes or he knocks, he's a brave young man to get into the position and constantly still want the ball. No, he is. He is. We, we spoke at the beginning of the season. His stats are very interesting, by the way, Stevie. How, how tall is Danny McGrain? <laughs> I didn't look but at he that. But he had bigger thighs. He had a bigger, you know, thighs and all the rest of them put together. Um, we, we spoke about Frimpong and the abuse, the physical abuse he's, he was going to get all season. We spoke about it early doors, didn't we? Yep. Um, I mean, we've seen the, the kind of abuse he was getting last season. He was stretched off the park uh, in one game because of the, the, the harsh uh, tackles. And we've seen it again on Sunday you know, with Frimpong. It seems to be the only way they can deal with him. Because actually, I felt you know, that his distribution was, was improving on Sunday. Uh, there was a couple of occasions where I thought he's actually, he's, he's picking the right option there. Um, so that's something you can work on. Of course it is. You know, you can work on, uh, I always remember uh, Alex Ferguson, the, the, the long running transfer saga where he, where he tried to get Paul Ince from West Ham. And the first thing he says at training was Paul Ince can't pass a ball. So they worked like hell on his distribution. Um, and then obviously he became a player that, you know, um, it, for a spell was, you know, playing for England, signing for Inter Milan, and he couldn't pass a ball when he signed for Man United. So these things, distribution, is something you can work on. And if you work on that, great. But I just don't think he has got the positional awareness to be a fullback. So I'd agree with that. And I think that if you do change it and you bring in somebody like El Hamid, uh, you're going for a safer option because it's the defensive issues that we've, we've clearly um, struggled with this season. So I wouldn't disagree with that. And perhaps we Frimpong, we can I call him that? <laughs> um, perhaps Frimpong needs that rest because, I mean, he's played a hell of a lot of football and it's it's the go-to option at the moment because he has done so well in an offensive sense. Well, when we get into it, Paul, right, and quite rightly so, Christopher Ayer and El Hamid were roundly praised by the Celtic fans for the goal at Perth. Oh, yeah, aye. But that's how much you're a position you are. Mm -hmm. The two of them. Two of them are a position. So the opposition break on you you're going to be caught. You know, Slavia Prague, El Hamid goes for a ball in the opposition, it's knocked through, and then Shane Duffy's basically one and one with a centre forward. What happened to Ferris Faros? The roles are reversed, and it's El Hamid one and mm -hmm. one. That's how you're conceding goals. Well, no set up, and everybody, oh, push forward, push forward. There's time and a place. There's 90 minutes in a game, you don't need to win it in the first 10 minutes. So we need to be set up better. We need to organise it. And again, it's a, a real, real old cliche in football that if one foot back goes, the other one stays and provides a bit of cover. Mm -hmm. Our full backs are crossing it for the other one to score. And seeing it works, it's magnificent. Seeing it doesn't get one shot at the back. At half time, uh, we, we spoke about it at half time, Steve, because the, the stat came up, you know, the average position on the park came up, and you could see where everybody had um, kind of occupied the field. And like Salt and Frimpong were both virtually on the halfway line. So it shows you the lack of cover there. Now, Yes, yeah, Celtic were, were attacking, but I, I don't think they were so dominant um, in that first half that it would allow your fullbacks to be so offensive. So that's a massive issue for me. Uh, another big one, and we, we talk about that triangle at the back, and it was something that you know Andy Lynch used to speak about um, when we had Van Dijk and Denier as your two central defenders and Craig Gordon behind them. And it's about developing that partnership. And once you get that right, then obviously your defence, you can work on that. And we don't have that right for a, for a number of reasons. But a big part of that is the change in personnel. You know, we thought we had a, a partnership. I thought we had a partnership in Ayer and Julien. But uh, after every poor performance, people were calling for one of them to get um, uh, dropped. And it did happen after Kilmarnock. We're also shouting and screaming for Shane Duffy to sign. He comes in. And now, unless you play with the three at the back, Stevie, it, you know, there's a question around whether he's a first choice now, which is absurd when you look at the Ferrari over his signing. And of course, you've got the goalie. So you wonder who who is your first time, uh, your first choice goalkeeper. So last season, if we looked at last season with Forster, 39 appearances, Gordon, 6 appearances, Bain, 9. So Bain is effectively the second choice last season. Um, but I mean, there wasn't much in, in game time between him and, and Gordon. So he was second stroke, third choice last season. All of a sudden, he's been elevated to first choice. Does that change when we go into the game against Hibs? Do we bring Barkas back in? 
in my opinion, he comes in in a heartbeat, Paul. Mm -hmm. And see if he's not able to come back in, then I think we should be looking at bringing in somebody in January and getting Barkas out the door. If he can't come in and replace Scott Bain, then he's no worthy to be the Celtic number one. Especially with that outlay. I mean, you mentioned it the other, the other uh, week when you were in and you were talking about bringing Barkas right back into the, the game um, against Sparta Prague. You said that uh, on the Thursday afternoon. It didn't happen. He's still not being seen. Um, so bring him back in. How much wrong did Bain do? That's not what we're looking at. We're looking at getting that understanding between your two centre-halves or three and your goalie, which we've not had all season. Could you go back to, <coughs> excuse me, an, an old-fashioned system that could work for Celtic, especially this season, where you have your two centre-halves, say it's Julien and Duffy and Ayer sweeping, or Julien sweeping and Ayer going one forward. The art of the sweeper. You know, I know. And, and push on. So anything that goes behind them, they guys are still there to get the debris that falls through. When we're on a straight line, obviously with Duffy being very slow, you know, to Tom, he's never going to get back. I was really disappointed last week that he didn't just clatter through that guy for Slavia Prague. Really, really disappointed. Just didn't nail him where he was, take the yellow card and everybody gets back and regroup. To allow him to go around him, was naive beyond belief, but I can't believe that he's that bad. So, do we have to nurture it? Do we have to change the shape a wee bit? But you only get all these things in its entirety if you get a settled team. Mm -hmm. And right now, when we're chopping and changing, and I understand if there's illnesses or there's injuries, you need to make the decisions. But where we are just now, we need to try and get our best 11 on the park and stick to that system. A couple of Names that you've mentioned, um, we'll touch on just now, Stevie. Now, Sorrow. I've seen a lot of people talking about Sorrow. I sometimes wondered myself if it was the old absence making the heart grow fonder with him because I've even seen Connell getting mentioned time and time again. There's a player who's coming right out of left field. There's no way he, he could be vying for a first-team jersey because he's barely played. Now, Sorrow, we have seen some fleeting appearances from him. But there was an interesting comment just the other week after um, the the poor result um, you know against Rangers and uh, everything that ensued after that and the comment that was made was that the poor signings was down to the head of recruitment at Celtic and I found that really really interesting so I'm looking at players like Clamalla and Sorrow who came in in January so they've been here for almost a year and I think I've said in the past that perhaps because of the way these things work and I'll use an example Craig Burley Paul Lambert were identified by Tommy Burns so they're in the filing cabinet. They've been watched by Davy Hay. By the time the deals get done, Stevie, Burns is long gone. Vim Janssen's in charge. Who signed the players? Vim Janssen. But just the way that happens in the process and sometimes the convoluted process is signing a player made me wonder if perhaps Clamal and Sorrow had been scouted and identified before Neil Lennon came along. Would that be a reason why Sorrow's not getting uh, used or utilised as often as some, of the, some supporters um, or can I ask him, you know, bring him in let's see him, let's see a wee bit more of him it, it shouldn't be, it really shouldn't be Neil Lennon is the manager of Celtic, these guys are all first team players if they are better suited to play in that position at present they need to play I've said this on numerous occasions, it's a great trait loyalty, but you can't have blind faith, and if Neil's just going to constantly pick the same guys even if they're not performing, then it's a fault we need to play the guys who's going to get us playing consistently well with high tempo and that gets us on the way to 10 in a row. Right now, I think we're lurching from one week to the other mm. and it seems to be right through the club. If we play well, Neil's the greatest guy in the world. He keeps his job. If we play badly, he's to be replaced. We're Celtic Football Club. We cannot have that in where we're undecided what we're going to do and how we're going to progress to get back to where we need to be. Mm -hmm. Through the, the process of having a, a whole range of guests on the show, what we hope to achieve, Stevie, is we hope to get a, a range of opinions. So, for example, I've, I've asked Kevin Graham the question about Neil Lennon, and Kevin wants Lennon to stay until the Scottish Cup final, the one that's obviously been carried on from last season. So we're looking at what's at the 20th of December. Mm -hmm. um, but by then, my concern is, you, you look at the running games, uh, and actually, I've had a good conversation the other day. If you look at the run of games beyond the Hibs game, uh, Celtic have got three home games, and you know you'd be looking at them hopefully under normal circumstances as three, three wins. It's maybe a better 
patch of games than than our main challengers have got uh, during the, the same period. But if something was to go wrong, if something was to be dropped, you know, it makes it worse on the eve before a Scottish Cup final. If these doubts are still there, you know, if they're still um, brewing and in, in, in amongst the Celtic support. And I don't like there being the, the two camps. There seems to be two camps, Stevie, um, in, in the, the thought process. And if you say that a change is required, then you're scoffed at because it's, you know, that it'd be even more harmful to make a change at this stage. Who's going to come in? Who's going to take the job, etc. But the issue is, is this cultural thing, you know, that's something that very, very rarely can the manager change a culture within the club. Um, it's been spoken about on two occasions now, and that's the big issue. And I, I've posed the question uh, earlier on this week, when was the last time there was a culture change at Celtic? Was there a culture change when Ronnie Dyla came in? He certainly spoke about a change of culture, you know, the 24-hour athlete and all that kind of stuff, Stevie, which, looking back, was great. You know, great words, but it didn't actually go into effect as um, he had hoped and as we had hoped, albeit he won the two leagues, we won a double. There was a massive culture change when Brennan Rodgers came in, wasn't there? Yep, definitely. So when we return back to the culture that had existed prior to Ronnie Dyla, if that has happened, and the people who are of an era whereby they're used to a culture under Brennan Rodgers, is that what Neil Lennon's struggling with? I, I think a, a, a real problem came during the game with Slavia Prague last week when the cameras went to the side of the park and John Kennedy, who's lauded as the super coach, was shrugging his shoulders and shaking his head as if, I don't know what to do. The week before, they were arguing about who was going to be substituted. That's no professionalism. That's part of the culture that's got to change. Mm -hmm. Whoever's in charge has got to be in charge. If there's going to be a change, and again, I've already stated on the show, it will come from the PLC. It won't come from Peter Law. They've got a duty of care to their shareholders and they've got to get the best investment. If there's an individual who's not performing, then they'll have them out the door. The problem right now is we don't seem to be in a real direction where we're going and how we're going to change this. Mm -hmm. We need to get back where everybody is singing for the same hymn sheet. You know, I know the mantra from the club over the last couple of weeks, we're all in it together, the manager, the changing room, the supporters are all good. We get a victory and we're all, yep, that's great. Then we get a defeat and Neil comes out and makes an outburst like last week. But no, and again, at the end, if we've got a defeat, we're on it again if we've got a victory. Celtic can't work like that. No. We really can't go on where we're lurching from one game to the other. 20th of December, that's a wee bit away. You know, what if you drop a couple of games? So do you wait out a sentiment? There's no sentiment in this game for me. You make the correct decisions based for Celtic Football Club, not an individual. No, I think so. Um, because there is there's a huge sentimentality around Neil Lennon. I mean, he's a club uh, legend as a player and as a manager, Stevie. And so you, you've got to get beyond that. I mean, that, that's a natural instinct to have, uh, you know, sentimentality around Neil Lennon. Of course it is. But you've got to go beyond that because the, the bigger issue is a failure this season. And if you fail, for me, we spoke about it before we came on, winning the, the two Cups of a normal season, Stevie, winning the two Cups, the League Cup and the Scottish Cup, that's a failure for Celtic. That's a failure. Now, you've seen what happened with Ronnie Dyla, that for reference, Ronnie, first season wins a double. As long as you, you win the League and a Cup, that's great. You win the League on its own, that's not so good. So the two Cups isn't good enough. We need to win the league this season. This is a big thing. And there seems to be this momentum, this unit, a strong side built over a period of time that believes that they can actually see this through. Now, that comes down to mentality, the winning mentality. I think Rangers manager's got a winning mentality. I mean, people might say he never won the league down in England, but I mean, he's a European Cup winner. He's got the mentality. Um, and I think he's been instilling that in several of the, of the players that he's been working with for a few seasons now. Celtic have got a winning mentality throughout the team, throughout the club, Stevie. You know, so this is what I find a wee bit confusing. Um, there's a contradiction there because on the one hand, Neil Lennon's telling us these guys have won 11 trophies in a row. They know how to win. I trust them. And then we get a really poor defeat. And then as you say, it comes out and there's an issue with the culture. So which one is it? Because there was no issue with the culture that, that won the 11, was there? Now there's an issue with the culture. Well, here's just a wee bit of professionalism that was under Brendan Rodgers. 
There's a young man, I won't tell you his name, who was going to be making his debut. He was to come in at fullback. And he was told when the goalie was kicking the ball out, if it came at foot high, he was just to pass it back automatically. If it came head height, he was to put it forward because Lee Griffiths would be in that position. And if it came to him like, knee high, he was to control it. He wasn't even allowed to make the decisions for himself. Mm -hmm. That was a professionalism. Last week against Slavia Prague, the players are saying we're disjointed. The manager saying there's no hunger, there's no application, we need to change the culture. We've not been doing this for that long that all these things should be away. You know, basically get the same personnel with some good add-ons. We've got the same coaching staff with one exception. So we should still be doing, be able to do the same things. There's something fundamentally wrong. And every time we get a defeat, Neil tells us what it is. So if you're the manager of Celtic Football Club, you need to be able to change that. And we need to change it by the time we play against the Berlin next week. No, you're, you're absolutely spot on with that, Stevie. Now, every permutation and consideration has gone through my mind since the Rangers game. Um, and you're looking at a change of manager. Now, if you change the manager, you've got to change the whole coaching staff. Yep. Right, so you've got a guy in there, Gavin Strachan, he's, he's relatively new to the job at Celtic. He needs to go. John Kennedy needs to go. You know, you don't just remove the manager because the flip, the flip side to that would be you remove the other two and you give Lenny his own coaching team. And I don't mean Mialbe, Thompson and Parker. I don't mean that because I know that's not going to happen. They'll not be back at Celtic. But... That's the flip side. So would Celtic fans be happy with that? Would that change enough of the culture within the club? I, I think if you're making a change, you need to make it right across the board. I don't think you keep... Everybody going. goes. Everybody goes or none of them go. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can go, right, I'm going to identify him, but we'll keep them because they're doing well. I, I, I think you've had, had enough of that with the previous incumbents, you know, getting guys that you need to work alongside. If it's not working, it's not working for them all. It needs to be, as you say, it needs to be a, a hub. It needs to be a team that's actually pulling together. I mean, you made a good point about Kennedy. I seen that again on uh, Sunday against Motherwell, that shrug of the shoulders. The, I'm not a body language expert, but I mean, that's blatantly obvious, you know, and that's when Neil Lennon's trying to engage. And again, I'm not throwing it out there, there's an issue, but there is definitely, it's fragmented, isn't it? I thought it looked as if it was recovering at Hamden when we played Aberdeen. Yeah. John Kennedy was standing in the technical area. Neil would run down the stairs. They would have a wee conflap. Then he would go back up. And then a couple of times during the game, they would change. Neil Lennon would do and Kennedy come down. I thought, good, this is the wee green shoots of recovery. You know, they're working well together. And then Slavia Prague, Sunday, shrugging their shoulders. No, for me. I've said Aye. it a hundred times. That's their job. They're no there as fans. That's their job. They, they're well paid to manage and be the vice or the assistant manager or the coach at Celtic Football Club, you've got to be better than that. Mm -hmm. Where you're not shrugging your shoulders and we'll keep going back to the day at Ibrox, Simonovic is sent off, a new manager at that time brought on a centre forward. You know, you think, oh my God, bang. That's top management, mm -hmm. that's top expertise, top professionalism, you're already ahead of the game, knowing during the week in your team talk, if we go down to 10 men, this is what we're going to do. Yeah, absolutely. We, we don't look as if I've got that experience and professionalism right now. And the buy-in, that, that's huge. Yeah. Where you've got that leader that you believe, as left field as it might be, as that substitution might have, have appeared, you've got the buy-in, you've got the trust and that belief in them. Now, we've brought them up, so let's read a wee quote out from... Um, the departed, Brendan Rodgers. Celtic is a unique club with a unique pressure where not too many clubs in world football have the expectancies to win every single game. He's been asked about the Neil Lennon situation. There are players to come back and I think they will go on and have a really successful season. That's according to Rodgers. Now, they've also asked John Barnes in the last couple of weeks about his thoughts on it. And John Barnes also said um, that Lennon stays. But again, if you're a manager, you're not going to come out and say, get rid of him. You know, you, you, you expect that from pundits, you know. Um, so I think that the situation as it stands at the moment, my view hasn't changed on it, Stevie. My view on a personal level hasn't changed. I've not seen enough yet. When Julien comes back in and, you know, who else is coming back? Yeah, Mikey Johnson. But at the end of the day, you know, 
Mikey Johnson is now going to be vying for a place with Luke Salt, who's been probably the most impressive stri- uh, signing that we've, we've brought in. So, you know, you'll be looking for a, a jersey. He's not going to walk into the team. Uh, I, I feel like I've been talking all season about Griffiths getting fit. Is that still, a, you know, is that still a consideration? When's he going to be firing on all cylinders? I'm more concerned about the form of Eduard, as you quite rightly said, he suffered from the virus, but even before then he was he was off his best. And I think it all com- comes down to the shape, it comes down to that understanding that, and amongst the defence and the goalkeeper. And we need to decide who the, who the number one is, Stevie. W- one of the best things I've seen on Sunday was at half-time when a Yeti was getting tore into El for mm-hmm. no day no one to him. You know, that's what I want for players. I want them to be demanding of their players. Neil Lennon as a player would have been demanding more of his colleagues than what he appears to be doing now while he's a manager. You go back, I've said to you before, if Barkas can he display Scott Bain, I think we try and get rid of him in January. You know, again, everybody tells me, I've never met the gentleman, that the guy Stevie Woods is absolutely magnificent as a coach. He's identified them, so he must see something. You know, so for me, he goes back into the team when we play Hibernian. Me as well, 100%. I mean, you, you'd also bring in Shane Duffy, bring him back. Depending if Julian's fit and ready to play. If he's not ready to play, then I think it's a real dilemma. Because, again, I think Beton comes in and usually does quite well. I don't think... I think he's great in possession and he can hit his 50-yard passes to pinpoint them. I don't think he's been great defensively, Paul, since he's come back into the mm-hmm. team. Mm-hmm. Two against Leo, he's there. Four against Slavia Prague, he's playing. The goal on Sunday, it's his fault. I don't think he's been... Can, can I, I don't know how... Does he look better because he looks more accomplished? Well, Shane Duffy just looks big warrior. Mm-hmm. So his mistakes are manifested more, they show it more, rather than Beaton, who'll get the ball and have these lovely passes. Defensively, I, is he much better? Well, this is the thing again, and we, we spoke again before coming on uh, air the day, Stevie, about the stats and, and the figures and the numbers and how important they are um, to the game uh, overall. And I think it would be interesting to have a look at Shane Duffy's uh, performance stats as well. Um, could it just be, and I made this point the other day, could it be that uh, Shane Duffy is lacking a bit of confidence at the moment? He goes away and plays th- two or three games for Ireland and that might build his confidence up. I mean, the international break, I think there's a lot of people at the moment, Celtic fans, who you know would, would much rather generally uh, be watching Celtic but I'm trying to take positives from the break as well Stevie as well as obviously um, but Scott- I can interrupt a wee minute see if Julian comes back fit and it's to be a four it's Julian and I I'm, Shane Duffy's no. had a terrible start yep. absolutely terrible start to Celtic career I'm not saying that he's better than these guys if you're going to go to a three I would bring him back but if Julian comes back fit I'm going to be a two and it's Julian and I See, Again, who were roundly criticised before Julian got injured. Yeah, and before uh, the arrival of Duffy. And the thing with that as well, Stevie, is Julian comes back from injury. We made the point in the, the European game. It was against Sarajevo, wasn't it, when uh, Beton comes off after six minutes. Was it Riga? Sarajevo. Um, and you're looking at Julian, you think, well, if he's on the bench, he must be fit. But he's overlooked for El Hamid. And we don't see Julian again. We still haven't seen him. He hasn't played since the game against Ross County. When it comes back from the injury, that's one thing. I mean, going over to Germany, surgery on the back, that's one thing. What about the match fitness? You know, it's like what you see. Is he, are we going to be able to throw him right into a game to start every game at the moment? You're, you're going Hibs and then we're looking ahead to the Scottish Cup final. Yeah, it'd be great to get him back for that. But, you know, you want to be able to bed him in. You don't want him to go in and then aggravate the injury. Well, the guys to play against a Berlin, he's going to go in for a hard game. They're, they've got good yeah. forwards. But again, even when people were claiming that he was an agitator and the trouble he was causing and just how you can hear a wee story that sort of contradicts that. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine has a gym and there's a French lady takes a dance class and the dance class was postponed because she was having to take her husband in the car through to Edinburgh because he couldn't drive himself. Her husband's Christopher Julian. So when his back was that bad, he couldn't even drive. Mm -hmm. So... He's kidding on, he's agitated for a move. The guy was genuinely injured. You know, so maybe people were a wee bit critical of him without really knowing the facts. 
No, you know, and, and when you're talking about agitators, again, had the comments not been made after the Ferenc Varos game, everybody would be clutching at straws on that one, but we're basing it on what the gaffer said. I mean, people have been trying to agitate for moves, so we've had a season of it, Stevie, and um, you're looking at it and you think, well, you can almost wave goodbye uh, to Europe this season. Um, as a Celtic fan, I'm never going to be comfortable with that. I'll never be comfortable with that because of the the prestige of being in, in Europe, the importance of the financial element, yeah, absolutely. But the traditions of Celtic Football Club, um, you know, and people might say, ah, but you're hacking back to the 60s and 70s. When you look at the qualification uh, record of Celtic into the group stage of European competition in recent times, that is something we need to actually base it on. Before we look at the historical element, and I've said this so many times between, you know, 64 and 76, 12 seasons on nine occasions, Celtic got to the quarter final of European competition. That's a European superpower now. If a club got to, you know, the quarter final stage nine times out of 12, we're not there now. We know that. But to get to the groups and to actually go out there and, um, you know, give a good account of yourself and hopefully progress. I'm thinking back to some of the horror shows that I remember in Europe. When you're looking at the Sparta Prague result and performance, is it up there with the worst that you've experienced? That, Noshitel Samax, the one Strachan's first game. Bratislava. Terrible. And I've heard again people saying Neil Lennon has got us out this jam before and he's fixed it. Well, I don't think he'll be able to fix a European campaign after the really successful one we had last year when we topped the group. No. And a really difficult group last year. I think the performances this year, with the exception of the first 60 minutes against Lille, have been so disappointing. And we don't look as if we can compete. That That's a worrying aspect. If we're at it bang on, and I know I'll probably get a wee bit of criticism about the Milan game, but we still didn't get there. You no. know, we, we lost 3-1 when they are sort of taking their better players off and they're trying to see the game out. You know, we don't look as if we've got a real shape, an identity as a team, and an identity and a structure that the manager wishes to play week in, week out. Mm -hmm. You know, they say, oh, you're playing against a packed defence. So does Bayern Munich every week. Mm -hmm. But they play to a system where it's usually the two wide guys, and then they'll put it wide and put the ball in. We're taking 22 touches before we put it in. There's a way around to play against packed defence, if we play the way we did some of the offensive ways last week against Motherwell at that high tempo, high pace, I think we look a really good side. See, when we're slow passing, I think we look pedestrian. Mm -hmm. And that allows the other team to get back into shape. To such an extent, like the wee guy I quite like at Motherwell, the wee guy Campbell, last week I think it's probably the first time he played against Celtic and didn't get a yellow card because nobody was getting by him for the midfield. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a few problems that we would need to sort out if we want this to be a successful campaign. What would a successful campaign be for you, Stevie? In all honesty, I would love to win the Scottish Cup to give you the quadruple treble. If we win the league and didn't win anything else, it's successful. The, the, the 10 in a row is vital, mm -hmm. I think, for the future of Celtic at the level we are at the now as a football club. Yeah. I, I don't see... And I know people say, blind loyal, we keep the faith. And I've seen the new one there, they spread the faith. I don't see them all turning up next year to give 600 quid if there's fans not allowed back at the game, if you've no one ten. And that is a distinct possibility. A couple of things you mentioned there, uh, when you're looking at Lennon getting us out of a situation, he's done it before, he'll do it again. The one thing I keep going back to in that scenario is, we've maybe been in a situation before, but was there a culture change required before? This is the one thing that I keep coming back to, Stevie. So let's say, or, oh, you know, December last year, we got beat from Rangers and we went on this run. Firstly, it doesn't automatically mean that history is going to repeat itself. It doesn't just happen year after year. But secondly, back then, was there maybe a loss of form or was there a culture issue? The culture issues were not mentioned last year. They've been mentioned this year. That puts a whole different dynamic on whether or not Neil Lennon can turn it around. Don't want to go into too much of a political aspect to this, but is the culture change between the different nationalities? Is that a culture change where a group of people are used to working a different way from maybe traditional New Lennon methods? Mm -hmm. 
that that could be a culture change that he needs to install in these players his way of working you know but again I would be loath to get involved in it because I really don't know the answer but if I could find out that out then it lets you answer the question much easier you know again I've, I've sent you the wee video and it came from official Celtic TV the night we were going to Riga and the team were coming onto the park and all the white players came out about 15 to 20 seconds in front of all the black players so is that is that the division I, I don't know I remember back to the um, Vim Janssen season and obviously there was the Battlefields um, fight between Tosh McKinley and Henrik Larson, and I have spoken to a couple of guys who were in the team during that season, Stevie, and they did speak about cliques. They did speak about divisions, and eventually, after Tosh McKinley breaks Henrik Larson's nose, that that was a breaking point, and after that, things got better. Now that was unusual to hear because obviously, in the modern game. There is so many nationalities in every single team, different cultures, you know, and uh, many of these people that come through, let's say the PSG Academy, for example, the Man City Academy, there's a culture that they're accustomed to. And I have said in the past that I think if, if an Ed, Odson Edward comes from the PSG Academy, signs for Celtic and he's operating under Brennan Rodgers, there's at no point, Stevie, is Odson Edward going to think that the methods of Rodgers are outdated or not what he would expect from an elite setup, And I think the same could be said about in Cham, for example, Man City. Um, so I take your point on whether or not Neil's methods are suited to good, certain groups of players. Absolutely. The other thing that, you know, we're talking about coaches um, as well, and it's come up, I'm going to go to the, the panel because every time you're on Stevie, you and I just get lost in discussion. <laughs> and um, I need to remind myself that there's a lot of people putting in brilliant comments. So you see, before you start then, can, can I make a wee point, and I would love your viewers' views on this. See, to take it back to a, a base level, and I know you've got guys like Bielsa who wear the track, isn't that? See, when we were under Brendan Rodgers, don't want to keep hopping back to him. I thought we looked really professional even at the side of the park. I think even just now, just looking at our coaching staff, we look scruffy. Mm. Does that manifest itself? Well, I've spoken to coaches in the last couple of weeks uh, and picked their brains about that very thing. Um, and it all comes down, obviously, to whatever the gaffer decides to wear at the side of the park. But what he did say, uh, the coach that I spoke to, was that the, the kind of uh, demeanour manifests itself from the gaffer into the team. So you look at the team and, you know, it, ma it mirrors what the uh, the outlook and, and the position of the, the manager. So I, I do get that. I, I certainly do get it. And yeah, let's make it clear, we're not looking back with, uh, um, you know, regret at Brennan Rodgers. That's long gone. But we are comparing cultures. That's what it is, Steve. We're comparing differences in, but, but in cultures. But if you get a comparable manager in, of Brendan Rodgers, Paul, you take him in a heartbeat. You know, and I'm really, I get fed up with a lot of the Celtic fans, you know, when other guys are mentioned, you'll not get him. Mm -hmm. You'll not get him if you don't ask. And if you set your bar high, you maybe only have to go a wee bit. If you set it with their mentality, then you're going to get Jack Ross. Great point. And the reason I say that is because when someone posed the question to me, well, who do you bring in? I would, I would always target the top of the tree. That's what I would always, always do, Stevie. And that's, I think, what we did with Brendan Rodgers. I think that's what we've done with Martin O'Neill. Very rarely have we done it in the history of the club. I mean, when we appointed Jock Steen, 1965, you know, he had shown some great ability um, at Dunfermline and Hibs, you know, so you could argue that that was the earliest incarnation of that attitude and that forward thinking move and, and appointment. But certainly in the modern day, Stevie, O'Neill and Rogers, we were going at the very top. We were heading for the very top. But when I suggested a top level manager, everybody scoffed as if we shouldn't be aiming as high as that. But if you've got a scale, and by the way, I like Jack Ross, and I've, I've you know, um, championed Jack Ross in the past, and I'm not saying I think he should be the Celtic manager, but if you've got a scale, Jack Ross for me is Tony Mowbray on that scale, and you're going right up to the, your elite managers, and the, of which there are many, either in jobs or out jobs at the moment, Stevie. So you make the decision, what's your ambition? And, th and that's your scale. 
And I, I'm not being disparaging to Jack Ross. I think the job he's doing at Hibs is excellent with John Potter. I think we're going to have a really hard time at Easter Road. But if you're looking at a scale, that's your scale right there. But, but let's we'll, we'll put our cards at the table. First and foremost, both of us would love Neil Lennon to be the manager of Celtic. We win 10 in a row. Absolutely. But if you're talking realistically about a manager and something was to happen to Neil Lennon, you need to get the highest calibre of manager you possibly can. Mm -hmm. You can't set your sights low and then you work down from that. Set it as high as you can. And again, hope your viewers don't take this the wrong way. We both want Neil Lennon to be the manager of Celtic when they yeah. win 10 in a row. It's something he thoroughly deserves. But if you've got to make a change for through whatever circumstances, aim as high as you can. Set the bar as high as you can and then you can come down a wee bit. But if you set it low, we're all going to be disappointed with a replacement. As well the the players whose culture you're trying to change. Yeah. Now, some of the great points coming through, we're going to have a look at them now, Stevie. And you can comment on Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. If you are viewing on YouTube, I keep reminding you, please subscribe because it's very important to us and we're trying to build that up. But the first point is coming in from Michael Quinn. In my view, something hasn't been right since Damien Duff left. Lenny should have his own backroom staff. I think the last comment is right by Michael, but we're too far ahead for that to happen now. There's, uh, that's why I posed it earlier on, Stevie. There's no way the club are going to remove Kennedy and Strachan and say to Lenny, right, bring in your own team and the dynamic will change, which it probably would. But would that change the culture? I don't think that's going to happen, although I do agree with Michael. It should have been the case. But Neil Lennon knew what he was getting himself into, you know, when he took the job, Stevie. He knew what the parameters were when it came to the coaching staff. He knew he was never going to be able to bring in Mialbe, Thompson and or Gary Parker. Now, Damien Duff, I've seen this mentioned quite a few times. Um, coincidence or was Duff that inspirational? But he was there when Neil Lennon came in. Neil yeah. Lennon didn't bring him in. No. He was in charge of the under 18s get promoted when Brendan left with all the backroom stuff. Yeah. You know, so Neil Lennon didn't bring him in to the club either. No, he didn't. And again, it's one of these things with... Uh, with Duff, it's a shame he did go because obviously he's highly rated uh, as a coach and uh, for personal reasons he's now with Ireland and uh, it's one of the ones that it's not going to go back, is it? I mean, he's not going to come back. Um, Red Scotland, thank you for joining us once again and you're commenting on YouTube. Nothing but straight victories domestically will cut it for me. Drop one more point, home or away, and it's a change of management instantly. Do you think there's a lot of Celtic fans thinking like that, Stevie? That's what I'm saying. It's a really difficult situation because we're lurching from one game to the next where we have a good victory. It's absolutely brilliant. Everything's okay. We have a bad defeat. Everything's an absolute crisis. We can't forward plan if that's the basis. I'm no one for Celtic coming out and make statements about referees and making statements about performances. I think this is one of the few times that I think Celtic should come out and say, we're 100% behind the manager or they come out and change it. I don't think they can just let this malaise to settle in between the support and the players because really what you've got to know, you've got a fragmented support, never mind a fragmented team. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got everybody who's in Neil Lennon's camp and you're not allowed to make a criticism. And again, it's only an opinion from what you've seen and you've got the other guys who are adamant that you should just go as soon as. You know, there's loads of points coming through in relation to the comments you were talking about in relation to how the coaching staff are dressed and people are suggesting that they should wear things like a bow tie. So obviously, <laughs> people people are taking that in good humour, Stevie. And by the way, you know, wearing a suit doesn't make you a good gaffer. Of course it doesn't. But, but, but I don't even mean wearing a suit. I, I, I think they're demeanour. I think they look unclean, they look unshaven Gavin Strachan's walking out the other days like should I go to Scooby Doo? I don't think if you're employed at Celtic at that level, that should be the way you look because if you were even as a young kid and you would wear your trackie, if you got your cup final they treated it right and everybody got a wee bit more dressed up and you prepared better, we're Celtic, we should be prepared every week and I think that's even the way the coaching staff look and appear Got a wee message coming through from Facebook because this is great, Stevie. You know, you get people piling in. It's brilliant. Tony Mowbray and Liam Brady wore Armani. What did they win? I think actually Mowbray wore Versace, did he not? Uh, again... He uh, wore a blue suit when he signed for us. Uh, it's, it's, it's a relative point, you know. Th that's not what we're trying to say. I just think if we're going through, we should be as high. If you look at most of the 
guys in the Premier League that everybody wants to be, they don't cut about looking the way we do. No, you're right. And I just think it's the, for me, it's more of that point I took from the coach, Stevie, whereby um, the reflection of the coaching staff is in the performance of the team. And I think that is the point I would take from from what you've said there. Um, when we're looking through the the scenario of, you know, people are coming in with regards to, to Jack Ross and um, I take that on board and it's not me being disrespectful. I've spoken to Jack Ross, I've spoken about Jack Ross time and time again uh, because I do think he, he is um, uh, an up and, still an up and coming. I think maybe the Sunderland job came too early for him, to be honest with you, Stevie, but he's still an up and coming gaffer. Um, and I'm not going to say that it, it never will happen in the future, but I just think at the moment, uh, you know, he's someone who is still trying to get it right at Hibs. They've gone out to their biggest rivals, Championship Club, in the semi final. I, I know a lot of Hibs fans are unhappy with that. He wasn't able to negotiate that. Um, so, you know, I'm not saying the jury's out in terms of the Hibs. I still think Hibs will be top three this season. I still think that will that will be the case. Hopefully not as a result of winning any points against us, I've got to say. Um, Jack Cameron, you know, makes a good point. Potatino is, is uh, a gaffer again who's in that elite category. But if you mention him, people will scoff at that, Stevie. Um, and I think that's where we need to try and set our bar. If, you've, if you're going to go for anybody, if you're going to make such a seismic decision as removing the manager whilst you're going for 10 in a row, it can't just be for another coach to come in and to run with John Kennedy. No, you know, it needs to be a seismic change. But, but even if you were to look at, and Pochettino would be one of these great guys you would have at the club. But even on a short term basis, and again, we'll go back, both of want Neil Lennon to win 10 in a row with Celtic. If Pochettino, and you were to say to him, listen, we need you to come in and manage this to the end of the season. And then when Solskjaer gets a bullet at Man United, you can go. You've then set the bar and we're in a much stronger position next year to negotiate with an elite manager to come in and take over. Because the players won't be allowed to get away with what they get away with just now. Now, Stevie, you mentioned that Gavin Strachan looked like uh, Shaggy. <laughs> and we're getting asked, maybe they haven't got a Scooby-Doo. <laughs> well, that's another answer, isn't it? <laughs> now, again, it's one of these ones with regards to the comments I made. I mean, you look at uh, someone like Sean Maloney, who's a hugely highly rated young coach. He was at Celtic. He's obviously doing some great stuff. Um, and, you know, you think to yourself, the John Kennedy scenario, is he, you know, it's almost as if he's untouchable um, at this moment in time, Stevie. And I, I agree with yourself. I want Neil Lennon to win the 10 in a row. I want him to be at the helm. If a change is made, it needs to be a clean break. And it's got to be the full coaching staff that goes out. If that happens, you need to set your target as high as possible. That, that's my view on it. John Kennedy has been a good servant to Celtic. Celtic's been more than fair to John Kennedy. John Kennedy played 35 games for Celtic before he suffered that horrific injury. He's now had 16 seasons on the coaching staff. If he's not up to the job or we're struggling because he can't improve his anymore, then he would need to go. Same as everybody else. You can't persevere in your job when things can constantly go wrong under your watch. You're right. Here's a point to tie in with some of the other things that's happened on the pod over the last wee while. The DJ of choice who comments regularly on YouTube, and I thank you for getting involved. Pochettino won't be a, won't be a manager in Scotland. He's eyeing a top four job. Now, I think that's a good point, right? So, yeah, it's going against what I'm saying in terms of aim high, go for an elite manager. If Celtic are doing well in Europe, then we're a much more um, you know, viable option for top managers who are out of work and we're not doing well in Europe. I've heard a lot of Celtic fans saying Europe doesn't matter. Europe always matters. Now, it always matters because you always hear about players putting themselves, Stevie, in the short window in Europe. Celtic put themselves in the short window in Europe. For players and for situations such as this where we're looking for someone um, of an elite kind of stature in terms of management. Would you agree with that? De definitely. Another wee thing as well. Right now... I don't think he can get a top four job in England, Pochettino. Because I think the top four clubs, unless... Who's your top four right now? Liverpool. He's not replacing Klopp. Chelsea. Southampton. He's not going there. They're, they're, they're your clubs, isn't it? He, he, he will go to Man United once they realise Solskjaer can't change it. He, he's in the same sort of situation as we are. He, mm -hmm. he can't change it. 
the players only played for him. One great game, one bad game. Here's a wee positive for you. I was reading that Frimpong's just got bruising. It's not cruciate ligament damage. Um, I will leave it on on the point now because you, I, you and I have not discussed this uh, in relation to. I don't watch a lot of football outside of Celtic. When am I going to get the time? By the way, I do this broadcast six days a week. Um, I don't watch much football outside of Celtic. And what I was saying in terms of the refereeing is that you know when you look at the St Johnston game, when you look at the Dundee United game. And then the game against Mullerwell. It would appear to me that there's been some, um, you know, tackles for me, Stevie, that were red, red cards every day of the week. I mean, I, I've not heard much said about the Tony Watt challenge. I, I reckon that was a red as well. Um, you know, when you're looking at the St. Johnston game, uh, I, I think that, that Davidson should have been sent off for the first challenge. And then the second challenge, he gets a yellow card. Connolly against Eduard all the, for the whole game against Dundee United to the point where he's injured for the Ferenc Varos game. So I'm not comparing it to any other uh, referees in any other stadium in Scotland. I'm just focusing on the treatment of Celtic players by all uh, opposing players and how they're not being protected. And how, for me, the refereeing's not been good enough in the games that I've watched Celtic play in, which is every game this season. So in terms of that, I'm delighted that Frimpong's not got a serious injury but it could so easily have been a serious injury. I thought the challenge on Sunday was absolutely horrendous and th this might sound a wee bit mad to your viewers. We're actually lucky it was so high. You know, it's within like a fleshy part of his thigh. If it's a wee bit lower, that could have been a career-threatening injury. But again, on Sunday, Andrew Dallas's performance was absolutely abysmal. When you think of the penalty we get given against us for Encham against Lewis Ferguson at Pataudry, and then the one when Gallagher's gets two hands on a Shetty's back mm -hmm. and then he tried to confront a Yeti. It was absolutely abysmal. But just a wee sidebar, I watched St. Johnson versus Dundee, Dundee United the other night and we had the guy Don Robertson officiating. And let me tell you, he was absolutely rank in that game as well. Horrific, horrific appearances and officiating during the game. You know, it's televised... And he, he's just not up to the task. No. So the standard has dropped dramatically. You know, you go back to Dallas, 10 penalties, 9 games for Rangers. There's absolutely no way you can deny his bias. See, when you're looking at that, and again, the, the reason I'm bringing the point up isn't to, to feed the paranoia narrative. What it is, is I, I honestly think that should Celtic, you know, get this turnaround that we're hoping that they do, Stevie, um, this is going to be tight it's going to be tight I've said it before it could be a point it could be a goal that separates Celtic and Rangers this season so the margins are so fine this season and that's why every single decision you disagree with we've got to we've actually got to challenge it we really do um, you mentioned earlier on we're talking about culture you're talking about um, certain things that um, are happening at the club the club maybe have this attitude of everything's great we're all clubbing together but you don't seem to get much from the club yeah, I mean, Neil Lennon. Neil Lennon comes out after every game and before every big game and gives his press conference, but there's not much coming from the club. Does, I, that, does that continue or is that just reverting to type? I think it's reverting to type. The fact that there's no fans in the stadium, you know, nobody can voice their displeasure. Again, I, I, I'm certainly no somebody for always coming out and making statements, you know, wait, like I tell you, but... I think there's a time when you make to make a stand. But I think in regards to the refereeing, if I was in charge of the football side of it, I'd be telling him as soon as the referee comes out of his car, that's when you start applying pressure. When he makes the bad decisions, you'd be ruining him. You know, and I know we're likely to run the a red card or a yellow card, but we can't allow them to make the decisions and everybody. We, when we seen what Dallas was doing to Yeti, when Gallagher's still chipping away his back, our captain should be in Dallas's face, make, making that a, an issue mm -hmm. because the whole world can see it. Yeah. It's not like the old days when there was only a guy on the radio. The whole world can see what's happening. But he escapes because nobody confronts him and makes him aware that everybody can see what he's doing. Now, Stevie, it's been an absolute pleasure. And, and by the way, you were welcome on Thursday night last week. <laughs> and you'll be welcome again because um, we still have another three games. Well, I've gone on about the three Europa League games, uh, the Lille result quite a bit, I reckon it's going to improve with, with age, I think when you look at where they are 
um, at the end of the, the actual season. Um, I think you and Kevin done absolutely magnificent to put on that show last week, you know, in the back of that result. It was a, must have been a hard, hard shift for you to put in, especially post-match. It was tough. Um, it was tough. The pizza helped, Stevie. But um, <laughs> it's been a pleasure to have you back on the on the show. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved. I know sometimes it can be tough, um, especially when we're all disagreeing. Uh, we're not all going to have this universal... Uh, point and everybody agrees with it, Stevie. That's part of the, the debate. That's part of the beauty of it. So thanks everybody for getting involved. Continue to disagree with me. Continue to get involved. Give me your comments. Uh, the comments continue overnight, Stevie. I read them in the morning when I come in and obviously have a look at the YouTube but that's channel. That's what makes it so good, Paul, yeah. because the guys who are looking into the view, gents and females, they've all got their own opinions. Agree, disagree. But that's what makes it interesting. If we all just said the same thing, then it would be pretty bland. Even all our, your guests are all the same. We've all got a different opinion and we all see things differently. That's what makes the Celtic fans magnificent because even when things are going well, we all look for the fault. Aye, we're looking for that standard, aren't Aye. we? Always. Well, all that's left for me to say today, Stevie, is once again, thank you for joining us on Celtic State.